at the tail end of 2022, I boldly proclaimed the RX 6900 XT would go on to become the best valued GPU of the following year. A previous gen flagship on a highly relevant architecture with ample VRAM that gave premium 1440p performance for a price that was hard to beat and that promised to get even cheaper. I clearly believed what I was saying at the time, to the point where I actually bought one for myself. However, in the cold light of 2024, should you buy one? If you're familiar with my channel, you'll know I'm not exactly unbiased when it comes to the RX 6900 XT. When I first reviewed the card, it was lent to me by fellow YouTubers Hardware Lab in exchange for an R9 290X and a couple of minutes of recorded voiceover. Not a bad trade, but I had no skin in the game when it came to deciding if the GPU was good or not. Since then, however, I've joined the 6900 Club. No, not, not like that. This Sapphire Nitro card was bought for the express purpose of allowing me to better run games that used more VRAM than my old RTX 3070 had to spare, and to help test older CPUs that would struggle to deal with Nvidia's driver overhead. I spent my own money on this card, and I've given my personal subjective opinion on it in a recent video, but for this review, I'm going to try and be as objective as possible. The RX 6900 XT has 80 compute units of RDNA 2 shaders, making it, roughly speaking, the 2020 equivalent of the current gen RX 7900 GRE. I mention this because the 7900 GRE costs about what I paid for my 6900 XT six months ago, and as yet, its existence in the wider market has yet to make much of an impact on the older GPU's eBay value, and I really think it should have. In fact, I'm halfway convinced if I sold my card today, I'd make most of my money back. For this one, I'm going to test the RX 6900 XT at mostly 1440p in some of the latest games out there and some bigger titles of recent times using the 2024 moderately priced gaming PC, featuring a Ryzen 5 7500F and 32 gigs of DDR5. Starting with the baby of the bunch, Horizon Forbidden West hit the platform running, being one of the depressingly rare examples of a console title that's been ported onto PC without a ton of performance issues. See Dragon's Dogma 2. Anyway, I'm still pretty early in the game and haven't reached the more demanding spots yet, but my test area returned an average frame rate in the low 90s at 1440p very high and rarely dipped below 80fps. Granted, this isn't a perfect experience, high refresh 1440p displays are getting more common these days, so there could very easily be a reason you want more performance than this, but on the whole I'd say this is extremely playable. Even the name of the game, Alan Wake 2, brings with it that inward drawing of breath between clenched teeth, the kind that people use when they're about to deliver bad news. This game is going to tax high-end graphics cards for years to come. If you want to come at Alan Wake 2 with a measly £500 GPU budget in 2024, you're going to have to accept some compromises. Thankfully, the 6900 XT can do pretty well, provided you weren't planning on trying out path tracing, of course. At 1440p high, with RT disabled, it just scrapes a 60 average, but does linger below that quite a lot. I'd probably be inclined to suggest using quality FSR, which brings averages up to almost 100, but has a bit of an impact on image quality. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora has a couple of danger signs for budget gamers. It has ray tracing woven into its quality settings in a non-obvious way, and it defaults to using upscaling. RDNA 2 doesn't have the greatest reputation for ray tracing performance, so I was prepared to have to drop some settings to get a decent frame rate, but it turned out to be just about bearable at 1440 Ultra with the highest quality upscaling. Here it scored just above 60 FPS on average and lows were only 50. However, this is a first person shooter and if you'd prefer a 60 plus experience, you can get there simply by dropping to high which delivers 79 FPS with lows of 65. 
If you know me, you'll know I like Paul Verhoeven movies, but don't like co-op multiplayer games. So I have mixed feelings about Starship um, Helldivers 2. This game seems to have a preference for Nvidia cards, but the 6900 XT still has enough horsepower to grind through at 1440 max settings without issues, and can achieve 77 FPS on average. Some worlds do seem to vary in terms of how demanding they are, so you might find performance drops into the 60s, but this is still extremely playable, and at max settings to boot. One of the many controversial aspects of the PC version of Starfield was its attitude towards upscaling. Most of the quality presets involve some form of it, and most of them look blurry as hell. To get a good, sharp output, you really want to be playing at 100% res scaling. Thankfully, even in a rough performance area like New Atlantis, the 6900 XT is up to the challenge. The average frame rate at 1440 Ultra passes the 60 mark with lows over 50 FPS. Resident Evil 4 is an absolute dream to play on the RX 6900 XC. There's enough horsepower to easily play at 1440p max settings, and probably enough for 4K too. Ray tracing isn't a game changer in this title, but at least at 1440p, it doesn't make the game unplayable to enable it. Without RT, the max settings preset comes close to 140 FPS. Whereas with RT enabled, that average frame rate drops, but only to about 110. Thanks to some post-launch optimization, the PC port of The Last of Us can actually run pretty well now, and video memory isn't as much of a concern as it was in the past. However, if you'd been playing on a 6900 XT all this time, you'd scarcely have noticed anyway, as 16GB was, and remains, more than sufficient for even 4K gameplay. At 1440p Ultra, the game comes close to 90fps, with lows of about 70. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart has been pretty rough going for the GPUs I usually test on this channel. Sure, it's a Nixie's port of an Insomniac game, and they've generally been some of the better console ports of recent years, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need some serious horses to run at max settings. The 6900 XT has what it takes. Mostly. With RT disabled, you can run quite happily at very high settings. At 1440p, I measured an average of 101 FPS so there's more than enough power here for even 4K. However, enabling RT should be done selectively. With everything switched on, the frame rate falls to 58 and 1% lows are in the 30s. Another game that doesn't like how AMD does ray tracing is Cyberpunk 2077. The 6900 XT can chew through rasterized rendering pretty well, averaging over 75 FPS on average at 1440 Ultra which interestingly is pretty much exactly the same as it scored in the game a year and a half ago. Enabling ray tracing would require compromise. The RT Ultra preset, which I should emphasize is not the maximum RT setting, cuts the average down to a third, only managing a paltry 26 FPS on average. Getting to even a solid and sturdy 30 would require either reducing some RT settings, adding upscaling, or both. So, naturally, the uber-demanding path tracing really isn't an option here. Forza Horizon 5 plays like a dream on the 6900 XT. Even the extreme preset, which delivers precious little in the way of benefits over Ultra, but still can be quite costly in terms of performance, can give a smooth experience here. I even turned on ray tracing at the extreme setting and still saw an average of 123 FPS, with 1% lows above 100. Of course, if you watched my last RX 6900 XT review in 2022, this shouldn't be all that surprising. So I also tested... Forza Motorsport actually runs pretty exceptionally well on the 6900 XT. At 1440p, it's absolutely reasonable to completely max out the settings, manually turning each one to ultra or high. Without RT, it's a borderline high refresh experience, averaging 110 FPS in the benchmark run, and only dropping into the middle 90s. 
with ray tracing maxed out, I have a couple of complaints. Certain cutscenes and intros drop well into the 40s, and even though I have upscaling disabled, there definitely seems to be some resolution trickery going on, maybe in the reflections themselves. But in actual gameplay, it's still pretty playable at just over 60 FPS on average. At 1440 medium, Fortnite is a breeze for the 6900 XT. The CPU is as likely to be the limiting factor as anything, and although my Ryzen 5 7500F averages over 240 FPS, you might find something like a 7800X3D or 14th Gen i7 or i9 can even stretch it a little further, while an older Zen 3 chip might not do quite so well. Once again, the real challenge for the 6900XC is ray tracing. With hardware RT enabled at the Epic Quality preset, the average FPS falls below 60. This isn't really advisable for anyone looking to play competitively anyway, but as a tech demo, Fortnite can look really stunning, but also really shows the deficiencies in a GPU's ray tracing. Meanwhile, you can feel free to go pretty hard with Warzone's quality settings, if you really want to. As usual, there's an argument to be made for lowering settings to improve visibility, but I'm not really the guy to talk about how to play a battle royale. Anyway, at 1440p with the extreme preset and no upscaling or frame generation, the 6900 XT can still drive close to 160 FPS. When I said that I thought the RX 6900 XT would become the best value GPU in 2023, I was probably wrong. It's still a hell of a performer for the money, and we probably have a few more years before 16GB cards are obsolete, but in the last year and a half, both AMD and Nvidia have upped their mid-range game. One day I might see if I can pick up a 7900 GRE and compare the two directly, but from what I can tell, there's a sub 10% difference in performance. This matters, because the 7900 GRE sells for under £550, not far off the going rate of the 6900 XT, but one is brand new, while the other is whatever you can find on eBay. It also faces competition from the 7800 XT, a card with substantially fewer compute units, but significantly higher clock speeds, and which can be had for under £500. There's also the RTX 4070 and 4070 Super, which bracket the 6900 XT in cost, and use less power and offer better RT and upscaling. So I guess the point I'm making is, the 6900 XT is in some pretty distinguished company, and if you still own one, you don't have too many reasons to feel bad about it. If you were thinking of buying one, and the price is anything like the cards I just mentioned, you should be prepared to haggle, because while it's still worthy of being among cards like the 7800 XT, 7900 GRE and RTX 4070 Super, it's not worth the same amount of money as them. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.